introduction. We good, thank you. So it's my pleasure to welcome Susan Holmes uh, to give today's IICD lecture. We've known each other for too many years to remember. Um, the key points of this are that Susan is arguably one of the best known statisticians working in the biology space. And she's done a lot of work in immunology and cancer biology and microbial ecology and things like that. Um, by her own um, statement, she enjoys big messy data sets. Um, she's been at Stanford for nearly 25 years. And she, I should tell you all, if you haven't already seen it, that she's authored a book with Wolfgang Huber from the M, from Emble, and it's really good fun. I actually bought this one, even though it's a freebie. Um, so it's a CUP book. It's called Modern Statistics for Modern Biology, and it's well worth a look. Um, Susan's interests um, include applied probability, Markov chain Monte Carlo, graph limit theory, differential geometry, and the topology of the space of phylogenetic trees, which is a really tricky area. So with that, thanks, Susan, for signing on in such a busy term. And over to you for your talk. OK, well, thank you. Um, hello to everybody. Thanks so much to Simon, who is one of the people I know who cares as much about biology as he does about probability and statistics and math. And so it's been, you know, it's really nice to have the opportunity to see Simon again, to find out where he is and also to share some of my thoughts with maybe an audience who might understand better um, than the standard biology audience that I'm used to, to talking to. So, um, so I can say things without you know, hiding all the math which is underlying some of what I, <laughs> I believe in. So I, as, as Simon was saying, I try to bridge statistics, biology, and mathematics. And um, this is a bridge uh, about 50 miles from where I grew up in Nîmes in the south of France. And it's a triple bridge. So, and the, the most of my con concentration of attention the last few years have been on microbiome and immunology. Uh, I did do a lot of work on phylogenetic trees and theoretical work, um, but I'm not really going to talk to you about that. I'm going to talk to you about the lessons that I've learned recently in interacting, as you said, with this big, messy, heterogeneous data. And of course, we're interested in simplifying through dimension reduction, and we use densities, and there's a certain duality between the observations and the features, which is really important. But also, we have heterogeneous data, and we have trees, and we have counts, and we want to put these things together. And in recent work, um, a lot of people have been trying to do nonlinear methods, and in, in particular, manifold learning. And there are a couple of things which I think the probabilists should be more worried about than, than, they, than they are. And then I'll talk about uncertainty quantification, because really, of course, as a statistician, that's what we want to get to. Now, the human microbiome work um, is joint with David Rollman, and we've had uh, funding from the NIH to study perturbations and resilience, and then uh, the Gates Foundation for the study of pregnancy. So what are the data? The challenges come from the fact that um, as a statistician, what you want is IID samples, which you don't have. They're not independent. Mostly they're longitudinal or spatial. Uh, you don't have variables which are predefined. Uh, you have features which come, which you have to sort of extract from the data. And you don't even have homoscedastic data. They're distributed on a manifold, but they're heteroscedastic. So what are the data as they're collected in examples that I'm most interested in? Well, we often have you know, RNA-seq or single cell RNA-seq now, but we, as uh, people interested in microbial ecology, we also use uh, 16S RNA gene DNA signatures in order to find out, you know, which are the bacteria which are present. We have mass spec data, we have metabolites, um, which we measure. 
usually the phylogenetic tree that comes with this data is preordained. So we already have the tree. We don't have to do tree building, but we do have to incorporate that information. So we have the tree. Maybe uh, here you see the tips. I'm going to call them ASVs and you'll see why. And then we have metabolic networks, um, which are also information which we have as we go in. So th those kinds of things have to be integrated into the data. So in, in trying to understand these heterogeneous systems, I think uh, one of the things that we do is we use the graph or trees which are known to influence or create priors on the data. Um, mixtures, nice probabilistic mixtures are everywhere. Uh, you will never have one parametric population, unfortunately, in biology. And so latent factors, which uh, this high hierarchy in the mixtures are really pervasive. We do reproducible research. So we have scripts in our markdown and packages. So we never stress about choices. You can redo an analysis with a different tuning parameter. And that's very important also for making all of what we do open access. And you, of course, and if you're going to redo things, you have to think carefully about what information you're discarding. So the first step in microbiome data is to do what we call denoising. And in this picture I have up here, this is joint work with Ben Canahan, who was a postdoc with me and very smart physicist. And he wrote a beautiful program for which enables you to do very large data sets. It's optimized in a very clever way uh, where you don't know ahead of time how which reads these correspond to which species or taxa. And the way we do it is actually, so we wrote an algorithm and after the fact, I thought, oh yeah, this is just how Google does words. So um, it's a pretty good method. So you could ask, you know, how many words does a person know? And this person is a criminally bad speller and um, doesn't use any kind of word process. And you want to know how many words they know, maybe 15,000 or 20,000. And you can start sampling. And if you just take the word and the distance in terms of edit distance, for instance, and try to decide you know, what are the main words, that's not going to work. You need an extra piece of information. And that's the piece of information that data two uses also for reads, which is the frequencies which is just like how Google works. It says, do you mean, because it sees that you have one, your one typo over from a very frequent word. Well, that wasn't how things were done before for doing microbial ecology. Everybody was using what was called OTUs. And the OTUs were defined in some sense as constant radius distances from um, some known species. And so this is the standard, you know, chime mother RDP um, from 10 years ago. This is what was done. And so you have this fixed radius of 97% similarity. You're not taking into account that your opportunity for error, if you have 100,000 sequences, is much, much larger than the opportunity for error if you only have 1,000. And probabilists, of course, you know, this seems very uh, fundamental, but it was completely ignored by the bioinformaticians who were working in the field. And they were just thinking of a simple method where you look at uh, fixed distances. So we do a probabilistic model that allows you to go back from the amplicon reads that this is the actual data that we have in the middle and to the original sample sequencing. And this error model, it, this works somewhat like a EM type model, that is it's de novo. We start off with a certain number of reads. We look at the most frequent ones and we look at if the next read is close to something which is very frequent, then we might be able to say that it was highly probable that there's a error. And here we have inside, uh, we actually have a, a, a score, uh, which is a quality score, which we put into our model. And the output of this is strains. So we have a much higher resolution, although um, OTUs agglomerated data, um, and they also, uh, if you're not within the radius, they, they say that there's a lot of diversity, but in, they don't, it doesn't denoise it properly. So you don't see the strains. And in data two, this is lactobacillus crispatus, which is really important in the study of 
the vaginal microbiome in pregnant women. And so we have these strains which are much higher resolution. And so this is, uh, there's a very nice tutorial and Ben keeps up a, a nice set of tools for understanding how this works. But we do um, benefit in longitudinal studies for being able to follow the strains. And strains are important. That is, um, as we see with COVID, um, strains matter. Uh, different strains are different and being able to have this information without going all the way through to the metagenomics, which can be messy, has been an advantage. So what do we get? Well, we get a table where we have the different strains and each sample has a number of reads of these. So this is a contingency table. And, but the rows in this contingency table were not fixed well, before we came in. They came from the data. And that's really important. That is, you want to separate the model that you're going to have from the data. And so we start off with the actual data that, that is generated, the, these reads. And then we go to try and estimate some of the parameters of this model to understand the probabilist, you know, the make probabilistic uh, statements about this. And this whole idea of separating the model from the data, I think, is important enough that you know, here's my plug for the book. Uh, it's open access. You don't have to buy it like Simon. But um, it, it, it does lay out this idea, which I think is still uh, quite confusing to a lot of biologists, that you have to separate the model from the data. And they're very different. And this has come up a lot for microbiome data where the biologists have been confused and have said the data are compositional. The data aren't compositional. The data are a contingency table. You can try to estimate a parameter which is compositional in that the sum of the prevalence is sum to one, but the data themselves are not compositional. So, um, and this is important when we're trying to estimate various kinds of bias and remove contaminants. We need the actual numbers. We don't need the, just the relative abundances. So let me come to a little bit more, um, we're going to develop the geometrical side. That was more of the probabilistic side. Um, so the geometry of the data that we have, well, if you have, uh, you know, you're doing some kind of features and you're measuring points with different, maybe different levels of noise, you might want to weight them, but you have weighted points in a Euclidean space. And on the other hand, you could see the dual, that is the features or the variables as vectors in a data point or observation space. And this is quite interesting and important duality, because in most of the biological settings I work with, P, the number of features that we measure is often 20,000, 30,000, or 70,000. And the number of samples or the number of um, subjects on which we have this data is in the order of 100, hundreds, if you're lucky. Um, you might have a little bit more, but in general, P is larger than N. And th this duality allows you to go back and forth and choose in which um, space, uh, space you want to do the work. So the, the, the um, original data might be a series of matrices X um, in different domains. Um, and we try to simplify um, the analysis by thinking um, in geometrically about this. But as I pointed out earlier on, and I really want to circle back to what I said as a lesson from the work we did with Ben, just looking at a 97% distance or distances are not everything. So you really have to have in mind at the same time that you have distances and you have weights, um, probabilities. And if you want to think about, you know, baseline probabilities and the distances aren't everything, um, the Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman is a wonderful place to start. So the, in the weighting that we use, we define these inner products. You can have geometries which are more nonlinear than this, and I'll come back to that. But the simplest one are the Euclidean ones with weighted inner products, which take into account um, the probability distributions that we have underlying. And we have weighted versions of PCA. And so what, what, what can that do? 
Well, I like to think of this duality that I pointed out earlier on, where you have to choose between whether or not you have n rows or um, the p columns in terms of this diagram, because you can choose which spectral analysis when you're doing generalized PCA you want to do. That is, if you have more columns than you have rows, you want to be doing the diagonalization of this matrix because it's smaller. And so this matrix only has N rows and um, it'll have N columns because it's symmetric. This one will be P by P and if you have too many features. So in some sense, duality gives you this um, the, the transposable data and the rank of the diagram, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but that's given by the eigenvalues. Now I will go into when you're comparing several analysis because it comes up a lot in multiomics that you have different domains and you want to combine the different domains. And so a very useful tool is this Frobenius inner product. And we did a review of its use but with Julie Joss in 2016, where you take a coefficient coefficient between um, characteristic operators for these two, for two diagrams, say, and it's just this inner product. What can we use it for? Well, for instance, if you had a whole set of data which are the same shape, but you they came from a bootstrap, you could make uncertainty quantification of the bootstrap. And so in a paper that appeared in PLOS Computational Biology about dimension reduction, we show how you can use this inner product between all the different bootstrap resamples to find how sure we are about the projections that you obtain with, you know, the standard generalized singular value decomposition, you'd obtain one point, but in fact, you want to align them. Now, it doesn't come out like this. That is when you are doing principal components or singular value decomposition and you perturb the data a little bit, what happens? Well, as you probably all teach your students when you do eigenvectors or PCA, the axes are not unique. That is that um, the eigenvector could be in one direction or the other direction or if the eigenvalues are quite close, you might have a switch between the first and the second axis. So the projection that you might get for these bootstrap or perturbed data, this is this one in turquoise, they are all over the place. And so you have to do, it's like what we do in, when we're doing brain imaging, you have to do alignment or registration. And that RV coefficient that I just showed you allows you to find the, the um, how to align in these multivariate cases. So this alignment is done with this correlation coefficient. It's very useful. And so that, that's how these were built. And you can see in this case, this was a much um, larger rank data. There's much more approximation. And this um, finding this O0 um, is done by taking this um, matrix, uh, say K here, would be um, the number of bootstraps. So you might have a thousand of this and you have a thousand by thousand matrix and you just take the first diagonal of that um, generalized correlation coefficient. So that's a, good, that's a good use of geometry. Now, what we've seen is you have duality in the data. You can use a generalized SVD that takes into account the probability distribution and the geometry, the Euclidean um, geometry. If you have a um, few samples, you're going to get a very good low dimensional approximation through di this fact about the ranks. And we can use an angle between operators to create a consensus where we can make now I'm going to talk about how do you incorporate something tricky like a tree into your contingency table. And this is done by doing um, the version of principal components that one does when you start off with a distance matrix. And this is called, in ecology, it's principal coordinate analysis. In statistics and psychometrics, it's called multidimensional scaling. And the idea there is that you start off with a distance matrix and that distance matrix, you can take that and do a decomposition and find the Euclidean coordinates that would give you 
the best um, points so that this distance is approximately the distance between these points. Now, that's ordinary principal coordinates analysis. And now I'm going to talk about double principal coordinate analysis. And this is work with Elizabeth Purdom and also Julia Fukuyama in the, for the microbial ecology case. So in that case, we start off with actually a tree and we can compute the distance on the tree. We use that distance to create here a certain low dimensional Euclidean space. And then we take the weights of all these uh, points when we have samples and we look at the multidimensional scaling of these weighted points. And so we have a two step um, process but this geom geometrical method allows us to say, we have the contingency table, we have the barycenters with regards to this particular weighting, which takes into account the tree. And this has been quite um, a nice way of representing my microbiome data. So this is a case of a perturbation study. Um, the colors have to do with patients. So these are three patients. And this tells us that the antibiotic um, perturbation for the patients E2 and D2 were in this direction, but F2 was unchanged. So was resilient to taking antibiotics. So we have a sort of graphical representation of the data which takes the tree into account. Um, so that's just how multidimensional scaling works and double principal coordinate analysis, as I just explained, is just doing that same multidimensional scaling decomposition twice. So you, it gives you both the species and the community co coordinates, which decompose the differences in a, in a maximal way. So this is the output that we got for the antibiotic perturbation. And the first thing that we did is this um, multidimensional scaling of the taxa. And then we can make these distances um, and use these points for the points with which we, we create the barycenters. So this is a way of incorporating our tree into our multidimensional scaling, and this was quite useful. We have follow-up studies now I'm not going to talk to you, which is much more interpretable than this, and we use topic analysis for that, but that won't be a subject that I'll talk about. So there we go. Then the next thing I want to talk about is the next step that is multidimensional scaling is a method which is like principal comp component analysis and singular value decomposition, it's linear. And much of the data that we are encountering, their relationships are not linear. So we have this challenge of nonlinearity. That is, we're going to go actually towards doing a little bit of uh, manifold learning. So the simplest possible manifold is the manifold, which is the curve, which is just one curve. So a manifold itself, which is just one line. So one dimensional manifold. And you can go actually quite far in various studies with just looking for one gradient manifold of one dimension. So this is data on the microbiome where we look at the gut microbiome across many different countries and different communities. And in this data, we see that you have, you know, this horseshoe state shape, which comes up again and again in this kind of uh, situation. And it tells you, you just have an underlying gradient. The gradient in this, uh, in this case is going from in some sense, the more traditional communities and the traditional nutrition, um, and this is the uh, Yanomani people in Venezuela, uh, and then we have um, hunter-gatherers in Burkina Faso, we ha had various people in Peru, and on the right-hand side, we have USA, Canada, Ireland, Ireland, and their food habits of other in, in some sense, completely opposed to these. So this is the kind of situation that you have if you have a gradient. And we've seen it time and again in the microbiome. These horseshoes occur all the time. Here's an example of horseshoes, which 
doesn't have to do with biology. It has to do with the US um, political polarization. And if you look at how people voted in the House of Representatives and you look at roll call, you have these two groups. And you see these two groups, which are actually like two horseshoes. We see one of the horseshoes from the back. So this one is actually only part, you know, being seen from the back. But you see that the gradients are actually not the same for the two parties. And um, the Democrats have this gradient, and then this gradient is very different for the for Republicans. And so within each of these horseshoes, you do have a gradient, and it works surprisingly well. And so when we were doing this, this is work that I did with um, Percy Diaconis and Sherrod Goel, we looked at the distances between the legislators as a L1 distance between how they voted. And we used both a kernel and just a ordinary renormalized um, L1 distance. And in both of those cases, we were actually able to find what you would expect the theoretical model to be, and you get these two horseshoes. That is, if you have a uniform distribution to start with along here, this is what you get, and this is what we observe. Now, this is the case where things worked really well because it turned out the legislators were quite spread out in a sort of uniform way along here. And so the manifold that you're sampling on, you're sampling you're in the, using the uniform distribution. Unfortunately, that isn't the, what happens. That is, I'm going to show you a real example and we don't have, um, that we don't have uniform distribution, but we still wanted to give uncertainty quantification. We did it in a Bayesian way. So this is work with um, Elaine Nguyen. And we have a, a program now that allows you to take some data and find what the underlying ordering or horseshoe in this case was. So we had um, very high dimensional um, data on contingency table of uh, the Tara ocean microbiome. And we plot in the first two dimensions, and then we can try to find what the gradient is and how sure we are about the ordering along here. So in some sense, this solves a problem that is hard, which is that of finding what's an underlying ordering in high dimensions. And we do it by this um, projection down onto um, one dimension, this one ordering dimension. And this is really important. That is, there's been other work done, for instance, by Elizabeth Purdom um, at Berkeley on trying to find what the progression of cancer or diseases are. And that problem is this gradient problem. It's the problem of manifold learning when you only have one dimension on the manifold. So progression, you know, if it's um, time, can you be your underlying gradient? Uh, and so we went about this um, by doing transformations. And this transformation is one which has been very, very useful, this notion, because in fact, it's what's behind a very popular method called UMAP. And it is based on the idea that I said quite early on in my talk, which is that the standard data are not uniformly distributed. And so they're not distributed on the manifold and they're not distributed in, in, in the space of counts. And so you have to rescale things locally. And so um, the idea underlying our method is we can do local changes in the estimate of the variances and do local changes of metric, looking at local um, distances. But this is, um, this is this transformation where you have the original data and you want to make them uniform. And so you can, you can make a transformation of measure and bring everything to a uniform space and compare things there. So this, this was done, um, and this appeared in BMC Bioinformatics. And the idea here was uh, this trajectory analysis of trying to find the gradient and done in a Bayesian way. That is, you, uh, you use the points to find out 
what you expect the variances and the standard deviations is to make um, a uh, weighting on the distances. So, um, so the first thing to get rid of, the first step towards trying to bring things closer to uniform is dealing with the heteroscedasticity. And so that's what we did um, using um, uh, a model for the underlying distances. And this is a Bayesian, um, this is a Bayesian analysis. And so I think that, that you know, it, I usually think in terms of hierarchical models, and I find the Bayesian way of doing things the most sensible is very probabilistic. So we can model all the different levels of where we think the noise comes from. And we did this estimation and the, the distances, what we do is we try to estimate just the precision or accuracy which we, with which we, we have um, local distances, because in most of these cases, so multidimensional scaling sins by trying to give the same precision on distances um, which are far away. Um, then distances which are local. And in fact, local distances, we, ho we hope to have much higher precision on. And so you use the local distances with much higher weight. And so this is what this does. And we use STAN to do this. And there's a code and you can look at the package and it's called BUDS. And so we get um, these uncertainty quant contours in the color that I have um, in going along the gradient the color, we mapped the depth at which the samples were taken. And so these were, these were taken at very high depth. And so, of course, the bacteria don't have much light here and they, it's much colder. And so there's a different class of bacteria growing in this part than there is you know, closer to the surface. And, and still we can see that the, the uncertainty of where things get projecting is not very, very large. That is, it goes, you know, you, in the bulk, it's very, very different here than what is going on here, but it's not a clustering. It's a continuous gradient, which explains um, this. And I'm not going to talk too much about the uncertainty contours. Just know that the way in which these contours were built was done using the Bayesian model. Instead of a bootstrap here, we have a Bayesian posterior. And I used the same idea that I showed you before, which is registration. That is, you have to line everything up to get the contours um, so that your space, your common space of registration is the same. So we can then build these contours. And that's done with this version of this conjoint analysis using the RV coefficients. Now, I, in my work in, with the immunologist, their favorite method is UMAP. And um, this connection um, to UMAP is really interesting. That is what we're trying to do in UMAP is to find an underlying manifold, but it's no longer one dimensional. Usually you, you have a much higher dimensional manifold and then you try and map various features or markers onto these. And when you ask and try to interpret what's going on, it is the change of measure, which is the most important. That is things are locally linear but they're not locally uniform. So you need this change of measure, measure. And so this is the change of metric enables you to get this change of measure. And I think the best way of understanding that is um, that for instance, if the points were like on a curve in plastic, you're going to try to um, pull apart the plastic um, imagine that it's like latex and you can pull it apart. So the points are no longer close together. They're on more of a grade. So that brings about a, a tension, which is an unsolved tension in the, this area, which is we don't have identifiability between having very dense points or that the manifold has very high curvature. Now, this is very often sort of swept under the rug by the biologists because if they have very, very dense data, they have a tendency to subsample that data. 
Um, but you can imagine that if the original data was on a very, very highly curved manifold densely, if you project it down, you get areas of very high density. So I think that's a very interesting unsolved math problem, which would be useful in a lot of different um, areas of biology, but it, it, it's a tricky one. So just to take home the message, we can use the points to estimate local variances, and that helps us in the inversion in some sense. And so we rescale and reweight using these distances, and we can combine the posterior picks to give us an uncertainty quantification. Now, if we wanted to have sort of a full Bayesian non-parametric model, uh, for instance, in the case of the microbiome, one could do that using uh, factor analysis or topics. And so Bayesian non-parametrics has come quite far. I worked quite hard on this about five or six years ago. Um, it's one of my favorite papers in the area. I've had absolutely no success with this being taken up by the biologist. And I just think it's a problem about communication of what are the issues in Bayesian non-parametric. So one of the things to say, which um, doesn't seem to be um, understood so well is here I called them OTUs, but what I mean is the taxa or the ASVs. The number of features is not finite. That is, when you come in, you don't know. It's not like in chemistry where you say, okay, I'm going to do a compositional analysis because I know only these chemical elements are going to be present. Here, this is infinite dimensional. And because it's infinite dimensional, it really is Bayesian non-parametrics, which is needed. And so this Bayesian non-parametric ordination paper um, it, that appeared in JASA tried to fulfill the promise of doing Bayesian methods, hierarchical methods. And we did try to find and project, you know, if you have data with low dimensional factors, you can make a model and you can estimate um, with uh, priors using a ordinary sort of distance matrix or in a product gram matrix. And the parameters here are just the latent characteristics of the samples. And so you have this and you have you know, some level of noise with them. And then we estimate this with a Dirichlet process. And I'm not going to go into too many of the details, but the method that we use in some sense, this is very related to what I was saying about PCA. That is, if I come back to this diagram here, we have, say, a thousand picks from our Bayesian model. And so we get a thousand for K equals a thousand. And each one of these is a different matrix. And then we're going to try and summarize that and get a, a, a view of what the Bayesian posterior looks like. And you'll see, well, if you don't do the alignment, this is the first one that um, Bo Yu Ren sent me. Um, he said, this is how it comes out. This is how the regions come out. And of course, this was done before the registration. So once you've done the registration, so here in this case, we have the output and then we do this RV coefficient. We do these inner products between the tables and we get a registration with this RV coefficient, which is much more satisfactory. And this is the sort of goal of some of our studies. That is, we'd like to have ordination plots in which you see the uncertainty with which each of the samples is plotted. So for this um, principle, or it's equivalent of a principal coordinate analysis, we have about 55% you know, of the variation is in this plot. And most of the points or samples are very well situated. There's no uncertainty, except these two. And so we went back and looked at these two samples. And these two samples actually have much lower depth. That is the library size, the number of reads was much smaller. And so you have much more uncertainty as to where they sit. And that's what as it should be. That is, in experiment, in our follow-up in experimental design, we need to know 
where are the places where we need to do more samples, take in more data? So this is very useful. So this Bayesian non-parametric analysis um, gave us that as a output. And then we did different, um, you know, we have a contour plot and actually these were different groups and this was an inter I mean, intermediary subject. These were all healthy and these were IBS. Okay, so I'm nearly done. I'm just going to say a few things about um, follow-up work that we're working on. And I think that um, one of the things that I discovered as a statistician is that people think that um, statistics is all about aggregating the numbers. And that's not really what we 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 want to do. And um, Don Knuth, who's a friend, he says in many places, it's very good for coders, that premature optimization is the root of all evil in coding. And um, I would say that premature summarization is the root of all evil in statistics. If you are agglomerating your cell, single cell data according to cell type too early, you won't see the transitions between cell types. We see this time again where people are rushing to cluster and the data, you're missing out on all the intermediary transitions. And so you often have not clustered data, but a continuous gradient, and you won't see it if you made clusters. So we have had some success in this idea of dis disaggregation. So we just put up a paper on, on the archive. And in that paper, one of the things we're trying to do is study cell-cell communication. But I worked with Aaron on this and I forbade him to agglomerate the data too early. That is the cells. If you're looking at cell-cell communication, you actually want to keep the cells and not summarize too quickly in order to see this. And, um, and this is unwieldy. It's not comfortable. You have, you have big matrices. You have to deal with a, a lot of challenges. But I do think that's the future. That is not to summarize too early. And um, this is just a little advertisement. Aaron is amazingly smart. Um, he's both training as a physician, but also uh, as a computational biologist and an immunologist. So um, this, is, this has got me really excited about the future in studying, uh, especially for NK cells and immune cell um, communication. So I'm just going to finish off and you know I'll answer your questions. I want to say that some of the things I learned, um, you know, where I'm allowed to look back, I'm over 65, I am looking back. And so I, I learned a lot of things, but I learned them all too late. Um, on the one hand, I love methods based, based on distances. And I realized that I wasn't paying attention to probabilities enough. So you need distances and you need probabilistic weights, both of them together. You need to allow yourself different approaches for different scales of the data and nonlinear and manifold learning are really important. Um, the, the raw data, you always have to look at what was done to the raw data. For three years, I set myself back in the world of microbiome because I trusted the bioinformatician way of creating the taxa. And they, everybody will tell you, oh, this is the standard. And you don't realize that the standard is losing a huge amount of important information. And we were losing the variant. So there are many ways of rounding and making approximation, but you have to poke your nose into what's done. Now, because I do reproducible research and open source, and we all have scripts, our choices are not forever. So as long as you save the sufficient statistics and the code, you're good to go. And as, a, as always, my analysis is only as good as the explanation the software to go with it. A recent paper we just submitted um, it's a six page paper and it has a 270 page supplement of um, uh, the code and all the figures that we generated. But, um, you know, I'm slow. I take my time to write my papers, um, but then everything's there. OK, I hope you have some questions and I want to thank my lab.
um, David Relman, I work for years with, and I work a lot with Catherine Blish um, and her lab doing immunology and um, the single cell work in particular was done with her. And I benefited from being in the school of statisticians who use R and Bioconductor and Stan now for doing our Bayesian computation. And thank you to Simon for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much indeed, Susan. Okay. I I, I hope um, everyone takes away a few messages about um, the things not to do. Um, and I do agree that not aggregating things does make your life a misery, especially as a probabilist, because things get too big. But anyway, <laughs> um, there are some a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe I'll ask people just to ask them. So if okay. you is there. Um, so... Uh, so. So I, I can read out his one. Um, so do you have examples of famous published results that ended up being based on faulty statistics? I think this might take a month to answer. He, I didn't, mean, say, he didn't say the last bit, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, faulty statistics, my goodness. Uh, have you been looking at the COVID literature? It's just like, <laughs> so all the time, 95% uh, is done by you know, just summarizing. One of the things I think that um, it's not faulty statistics, it's the use of p-values when you don't know what the denominator was. That is a lot of um, p-hacking goes on because people are under a lot of pressure to um, publish and the publication uh, you want a p-value so you don't see all the manipulation of the data that's done. So that, uh, that that's definitely something which... Uh, uh, so for instance, in my field, in the field of the microbiome, there have been all kinds of crazy studies about um, um, the microbiome. You know, there was the microbiome of... Uh, in breast milk or in babies in the placenta and it was just the data weren't denoised right I don't know whether you could call it faulty statistics or faulty bioinformatics or faulty um, but we have that all the time um, there, there are lots and lots of things uh, uh, there's a famous study about um, ESP that was done by Bem at Cornell, which showed the, through statistics the, but the, the presence of ESP, extrasensory perception. And the way that happened was he'd been studying that for 45 years. And after doing 45 years worth of testing, he finally got something which was significant. And it went up on the first page of the New York Times, of course. So, and it was published, but you know, if you, you have this huge file draw effect, so so statistics, statistics is badly used by people who don't understand about statistics. Um, I can put up, um, so there was a request for the, I can see the chat now. Um, so one thing is I have put up, I have a Twitter account and on Twitter, I put a link to my slides just before giving the talk. So if you go, uh, my Twitter account is Sherlock, P. Holmes. And if you look at my Twitter account, um, I put up um, uh, a link to a Dropbox uh, folder uh, with, um, this, with this talk in it. So that you'll find all the different references in that, um, in that talk, because I realized that I went too fast on the, on the references. Sorry about that. That's great, thanks. Um, and th any more questions? So there was another question in the chat and I'm going to answer it by going back. And the question is, are you, is there a particular type of heterogeneous data? And I would say, yes, um, here's an example. Um, recently in a Gates study, we had, um, we have transcriptomic data, metabolomic data, phylogenetic trees. We actually have also the uh, cytokines and immune data. So all of those need are needed 
uh, it's multi-domain or people call it multi-omics. I don't really like multi-omics because it doesn't include images. And some of the data, sometimes they're images, they're not really omics. It's just multi-way arrays or multi-domain data. This is something that's been going on for 20 years, but all of a sudden, you know, people have woken up to the fact that we have this huge heterogeneity. But in this case, you know, I have the metabolites, but I also have the phylogenetic tree. So I have networks and trees and contingent tables and gene expression. So that's a lot of heterogeneous data. Any, ah. Uh, no, so um, I would say that you can't have, in France, we say, on peut pas avoir le beurre et l'argent du beurre. You can't have the butter and uh, the, the money from the butter, as a farmer would say. <laughs> I don't, I can't, you can't, what is it? You can't have your cake and eat it. Um, so in the case of UMAP, UMAP is a method for, it does local, um, we're looking at local structure. So the far away distances in UMAP are meaningless. And that's the way it is. And I think the only way of thinking about that is you shouldn't look at data only in one way. So um, you need to look at data both at a local scale and at a global scale, and you need several pictures of something. And so you don't only look through one tool. You don't only look through the microscope. You also take pictures you know, from far away off. And so I, it doesn't bother me. I don't want I don't want to use only one method. I want to use a lot of, I have a lot of methods in my toolbox, as long as you know that one method doesn't beat them all. Um, I don't think that, that that doesn't bother me. And there's a much better version of UMAP now, which takes into account densities. So the dense UMAP is the one that does the probability and the manifold at the same time. Um, yeah, Dave. So I'm intrigued by the Riemannian geometry references. So I have two related questions. Um, I mean, first, um, it, this is not the same thing as statistical manifolds and information geometry, because that's comparing distributions and you're working with data. Is there yes. a name for this if we wanted to read more about it? And then the second question is, you talk about frequency and distance. So is studying a density function on a Riemannian manifold the right framework, or do you need a theory like Riemannian geometry that's not there yet? Um, I think that the big problem for me, when I've talked to people, I talk to people like Brian White, who do probability and, you know, who, who know probability and manifolds, um, is I think some of the theory isn't there yet. That is, we do have this problem of identifiability. That is the curvature and the density, um, you can make it look either way. So you need to put in extra constraints. But um, if you want to read more, it's a very nice um, series of articles written by a collaborator of mine who's very good because he's a mathematician and a, a computer scientist. His name is Xavier Penek. And I put his name up. So if you wanted to read about differential geometry and statistics, and for instance, of course, this comes up hugely in image analysis. When people do um, brain images or bones and things like that, the images themselves, um, you have all these problems of registration. So, you know, there you have, it's only known up to rotations what, what's there. So it's definitely uh, Riemannian and you have a probability distribution. So Xavier's done a good job on that. So I think, Tian, can you ask your question? Yes, um, thank you, Susan, for a great talk. I came late. Maybe you have already addressed this. Um, for, um, for statistical methods that tend to uh, try to create a geometric interpretation of the structure in the data, the choice of, the choice of distance and metrics is, is crucial. Um, because when you when you when you when you derive those kind of embedding from like a multi-dimensional scaling or any of the kernel PCA, some of the structure you see in the results uh, are artifacts of the metric you choose, not yeah. necessarily something that I think you alluded to some of that in, 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 your, in your comments to address the previous question about some of the some of that. So my question is one is what what would be your insight as the ultimate feedback mechanism from the science 
you know, two 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 statisticians were asked to to know what what structure would be the the real one. And second, do you see do you see as we make further progress in this, there will be a more automatic um, automatic algorithm to to choose the the metric, like a, yeah. like in the auto auto ML, you know, uh, you know, meta learning literature that that. <laughs> So I don't, I, I'm a statistician. I don't believe in black boxes. Uh, I, I, and I work with people who want to understand their data. So we're not in this situation where you just want to, you know, just want to predict one number. They don't, they're trying to understand all the pieces in a complex picture. So when you're making a complex picture, you want to have many, many different visions. So I often, um, in R, it's very easy. You just loop through all the distances. We loop through 40 distances. And you can loop through all 40 distances. You look at them. And then you try and um, see if there's any meaningful structure. And one of the things we do very often is we go back to the biologists, the pictures that look the most interesting, and we ask them about extreme points. Because the extreme points, which are real data points, and we say, what is it about these two subjects which makes them the most diff different, for instance, or something like that? So you, you want to go back sort of um, interactively and work with the collaborators to try and do the interpretation. I mean, in the same way as if I take the example of the horseshoes for the representatives, um, how did we know that it was left and right? Well, we looked at the two extremes on the horseshoe and we saw it was the most left wing and the most right wing. And so you can do exactly the same with biology data. That is, you are you see this natural gradient, as I showed you with the microbiome. And we saw that the hunters gatherers were completely on one side and you had Ireland on the other. So the people who eat the most processed food are the extreme ones, right? So, and so, the, and that came from the data that that is told to you by the data. And so you, you get a much better understanding of, of the relative importance of the structure. Great. Eh, yeah. Um, just looking through, I think, we're all right and there's no hands so it's just coming up to right. five o'clock and susan has been kind enough to spend some more time chatting to some of our guys in the institute which is fantastic thank you susan for a fantastic talk that was great okay um, and good luck with your next hour or so okay uh, thank you thank for you having everyone me. the next talk in the series by the way is on the 17th of march four o'clock so a month from today Ah, I see some more people I know in the in the images. 